and like introduce you, Tim. All right, so, all right, cool, we're recording. So thank you, Tim, for joining us. Um, uh, if you don't know already, every Friday, usually around this time, we have discussions, uh, land discussions. It sort of started out of, uh, you know, because of COVID and then the stimulus checks. And we, we read a post that people were using their money to buy land and start a farm to feed their families. But, um, you know, I think the conversations were, were, we felt like it was important to learn how we work together some experiences that we've had, you know, even us included, like how we were a part of certain groups and then certain things that came around, uh, came about that were, uh, that were issues. And then how do we, um, and then how do we like take care of the land and what are sort of the available options out there, um, that we can be more aware of. So we had discussions around community land trust, um, discussions on like land management techniques, <laughs> raising quails, um composting and then we had a talk yesterday uh, or yesterday a talk last week on like homelessness and all that so seeing how uh how very entangled um our relationship to the land is you know in terms of like uh not only it, it, uh, it as a resource but you know the issues around property um you know capitalism all that so um thank you for joining us and uh yeah i guess if you want to share or introduce yourself a little bit uh, feel free to go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Teresa. And hello to everyone who's joining us uh, this evening. I'm Tim Martinez. I am the Program and Land Administrator for Arroyos and Foothills Conservancy. Um, and uh, AFC is a nonprofit land trust. And so uh, our mission is, to, we, we started 20 years ago, to uh, preserve the remaining natural open space in Altadena up in the foothills. We were actually known as the Altadena Foothills Conservancy uh, back then. Um, but the mission has since expanded. So we work uh, throughout the region. We're based in Pasadena, but we work throughout the San Gabriel Mountain foothills, uh, the San Rafael Hills, which are in between like Pasadena, Eagle Rock, Glendale, um, and in the Verdugo Mountains area out to uh, like Sunland Tahunga. Um, and we work uh, to save natural open spaces uh, and we do that by, um, you know, we, we're a land trust, so we, we're a nonprofit, and we, uh, we acquire these properties. We buy properties. Oftentimes, uh, these properties are under threat of development. Almost always, our, our nature preserves that we have now have been under threat of um, development. And so we, we uh, you know, we preserve them. Um, we buy them. We, we, you know, we create nature preserves uh, to save the, the natural land as it is forever. Um, and then we set about uh, restoring the land. So we restore the habitat, try and bring it back to its, you know, as close to its native habitat uh, as we can. Um, that involves like, you know, taking out invasive plants, stuff like that. Uh, we engage the community. We create friends groups at each of these nature preserves. So that's, uh, you know, the local community uh, sort of, um, you know, advising us and, and uh, you know, stewarding the land and, and being the ones uh, to really um, you know, kind of be uh, on the ground and, and just help steward and put on programs and, and stuff like that. So we really try to have a sense of ownership and, and engagement and access for the local community and make it a resource for all of the communities that we serve. That also includes things like education, field trips. Um, and uh, really what our mission has, has expanded to um, is we're trying to connect all of these natural open spaces in our region uh, with wildlife corridors, because that's um, that's one of the number one ways that we can preserve our biodiversity uh, in the face of climate change, and just uh, in general, make sure that the the wildlife, uh, you know, that their genetics remain diverse, um, that even you know the the plant life can, uh, you know, uh, move around and spread, and, and you know have that di diverse gene pool, because uh, we live in a very um, you know special place here in California in terms of biodiversity. So that, that's really, our, our mission's really evolved to, uh, you know, try to connect these places and, and keep our entire ecosystem healthy and, uh, and you know, really connect it with the communities we serve and, and, and have these natural lands, you know, uh, be a resource um, for, for all of the, the communities that we serve. So I have a video, if, uh, if it's okay, it's like four minutes that I'd like to share that's sort of a, I think it's a nice uh, introduction to, um, some of the work we do trying to, you know, preserve and connect up these natural areas. And a big part of that is 
um, we work with camera trappers or you know, uh, cities or community scientists rather who set up motion sensor um, wildlife cameras and and it, it uh, really helps to tell the story and connect people to the the amazing wildlife and nature that surrounds our region uh, in a way that uh, well you kind of have to just see it for yourself so if it's all right with you Teresa and Joe I'll try to get this video up so yeah let me know if you need help okay thanks I'm gonna start share oh I see okay is that working yes I, I see it YouTube yeah all right great so uh, to share is, that, audio. is that full screen oh I do I have to share audio too yeah all right let me see where do I go to do that? I think it's the same place. It might be the same place. Oh, there you go. It's working. You can hear? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I'm Tim Martinez, and I'm the program administrator for the Arroyos and Foothills Conservancy. We're a land trust, so we work to save our natural open spaces here in the local area. Here in California, we actually live in the most biodiverse area in the whole United States. Not only do we want to save land, but there's a broader context to saving land. Nothing tells the story better of the importance of preserving these open spaces than actually seeing the images of the wildlife and the videos of the wildlife themselves. I'm Joanna Turner. My name is uh, Denny Calais. I am a camera trapper. 4.50 a.m. We saw their work and we said, it's the perfect partnership. So we teamed up with them. They're now advisors to our conservancy and demonstrate to people that we have all these amazing species of wildlife that are literally right there in their own backyard, which they may have never seen their entire life. Camera trapping is using either commercially made or home-built cameras with motion sensors, setting them out along a game trail or a human trail. And when an animal just come by, the camera get triggered and you get a picture. It's like being a spy. <laughs> there is a lot of extra work you have to do. You gotta understand the way they move. So no leaves to fall in on it. The edges are real sharp. You gotta understand the way they leave. It's really fun and really frustrating at the same time. I got a half a cougar. This is really hard to do. Seven months to wait just for one picture. We followed fresh lion tracks and got really excited and walk home empty handed. Nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing here. When you do get something, it's exciting. It's a scavenger hunt type of feeling. One picture will make everything great. There's something about these wildlife photos that people just are drawn to. It's visual and it has an impact on people. It's a thrill to be able to see that and to know that we live in a place that's surrounded by such wonderful and diverse nature. The images that we've been getting allow people to understand the animal in a different way. An animal walking through in the middle of the night when nobody's around is going to act normally. They're going to be calm. They're going to take their time. That's as close as we've seen. Yeah. Oh, she's rubbing on There's a connection here that is personal. It's those personal experiences with nature that makes people care. It send a message to people, it's out there. And it send a message we need to conserve. If they don't know it exists, they're not going to want to protect it. I think it's an eye-opener for the effect of urbanization. Our natural open spaces are becoming islands of habitat, surrounded by development, by freeways, by roads, where animals couldn't get in or out. Creating wildlife corridors and connecting up all these open spaces is actually the number one way we can preserve our biodiversity. They need space. I mean, if they have the space and they thrive, we will thrive too. I think it has much broader implications for 
the health of the ecosystem that we live in than a lot of people even realize. It moves beyond wildlife photography because for us, this is data. We're actually seeing where the wildlife move, where we need to connect up areas, and what species we even have there. What started off as a passion project has become something that's really contributing to our understanding of local wildlife. All righty, let me figure out how to, there, we back to normal? Yep, yeah, that's good. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's probably a better introduction than I could have done just because it had the cool videos and photos and everything. Uh, so that's one aspect of what we do, you know, with AFC is, you know, trying to connect our natural areas with corridors and, uh, you know, keep our ecosystem healthy. Um, but, you know, creating nature preserves, uh, you know, buying land to, you know, specifically to save it, uh, it, it's not just about wildlife, it's not just about plants, it's also about the communities that we serve. So that's part of my job is, you know, as the land and program administrator, I oversee the, the stewardship of the land. So that's everything from, you know, habitat restoration, taking out the invasive plants that are harmful, um, you know, trail work, uh, stuff like that. Just basically taking care of the nature preserves to also uh, trying to connect these natural areas with the communities that we serve and even, you know, uh, broaden that community, right? Uh, uh, you know, extend it out e even further and, and actually even bring nature back in, into the city in various ways, uh, you know, through nature education. Um, because like, like we were saying in the video, if people don't have those personal connections with nature, especially kids, uh, children, you know, then um, you know they're not going to care, right? They're not going to have that connection uh, to the land. So that's really important. And I know that you, uh, you know, Joe and Teresa have been, you know, helping us very much, uh, you know, to connect with the community with some of the events that that we've uh, collaborated on, and you know, some of the uh, you know um, connections that, that you know you've been making with us, like for instance, with the Native community. And so uh, you know, there's a lot of different communities, constituencies that we. Are working on serving that we hope to serve. Uh, so that's generally what we do at AFC. I mean, I'm open to any sort of questions or comments or anything like that. Discussion. Yeah. If um anyone would like to type any questions or even just unmute, unmute yourself, that's cool. Um, I wanted to ask you about Tim. Like, what do you for those that might be interested in getting in, the, in this kind of field? Like, what was sort of your career path? uh that either led to you know in your interest in doing this kind of work and then what were some things that you you know you learned along the way to within within this career path um yeah so uh you know the first thing is is that i was i was lucky enough and, and privileged enough that uh i grew up with those connections with nature as a kid because the way i see it uh, is that planted seeds, you know, and even, you know, maybe I turned, you know, I became a teenager, maybe I don't care so much about nature, but ultimately I came back to it. Um, you know, I found solace in nature, uh, you know, going into natural areas. And, um, you know, so the first thing is, is having those touches with nature, which is why I, I understand what a profound impact it can have to introduce, especially like the youth to nature, to the outdoors, um, so that was the first thing that, that set me on my path. Uh, the next thing is, is that when I started going out into nature again, maybe in high school or, you know, when I maybe got into college, I started exploring the local, the San Gabriel Mountains a lot more. Um, you know, it, it brought me such peace and comfort and, and you know, this, to be around all, the, you know, the beauty. I just, I, I just, uh, I love the feeling of being in nature, but then that's also when I started to um recognize or become aware of uh i mean quite frankly all the ways that nature is being destroyed uh whether that was plastic pollution uh like you know our rivers you know i, I grew up right right here in pasadena near the arroyo seco and so to see the river clogged up with styrofoam or whatever i mean that was heartbreaking to me you know i mean uh, to the point where uh you know i couldn't sleep at night <laughs> because I was just thinking about all that stuff going into the ocean and just what a mess, you know, that our, our planet, our world, our environment is becoming. Um, so, you know, a lot of experiences like that where the more I learned, my first reaction was just like, uh, I don't know, maybe kind of extreme. I was just extremely upset. 
Um, but then that turned into wanting to take action, wanting to, to do something about it in the time that we have here, uh, you know, on the planet, right? So uh, I just wanted to, you know, I kind of just wanted to be on a mission. And so uh, in my early 20s is when I, I started volunteering. And I, the first thing I did, interestingly, was I, uh, you know, my mom being from, you know, kind of baby boomer generation, uh, the environmental group that she really was most familiar with was the Sierra Club, which is the biggest, you know, sort of national environmental group. It's one that, you know, a lot of people are generally aware of. So I started going to Sierra Club meetings over at Eden Canyon in Pasadena. And uh, anyway, that was an interesting experience because I was by far, by many decades, the youngest person there. And they were drinking stuff out of styrofoam cups, actually. And I was just like, these people are environmentalists. Like, what are they doing? You know, even though I met a lot of really nice, you know, really great folks who were working on really great things, locally um uh you know and i'm, I'm still friends with uh you know several of, of the the people in the pasadena sierra club um but you know that i started going to those meetings i i, I didn't feel like i quite fit in and they, they kind of would look at me kind of quizzically and just you know i remember uh someone who was one of their leadership who ended up he, be, he became a friend of mine um and one of my first mentors uh david samansky who's since passed away I remember him kind of just like asking me because uh, I'd go to protest with him about like, I don't know, some mountains they were going to level like out in um, Monrovia or something. I forget where it was. But so, you know, I'd go to these things with him, these these protests or these events. And he kind of just like, you know, be looking at me and like, Tim, so, uh, you know, we've been discussing, we'd like to engage the youth. And uh, how, how do we do that? And I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> you know like I was kind of a, an outlier. But uh, I went to a meeting one night and Tim Brick of the Arroyo Seca Foundation gave a talk about uh, a, uh, a river restoration that just happened below the Colorado Street Bridge in Pasadena in the, in the lower Arroyo. And I, I was running on the trails down there at the time and I saw this restoration work go in with like they were introducing native fish. And so I was just like, oh my gosh, like you were involved in that. And so he became a mentor of mine and I became a longtime volunteer for the Arroyo Seco Foundation. I led, uh, you know, countless trash cleanups in the Arroyo and elsewhere. I was part, you know, I'd, I'd volunteer for uh, La Gran Limpieza, the big, uh, you know, cleanup of the LA River every year, work with Heal the Bay and Friends of the LA River. And I ended up just, while actually when I was, when I was first getting to know you, Joe, when I was at PCC, when I was still in college, um, taking classes, I, I volunteered basically for years. So no, I wasn't getting paid for many, many years, but what that led to, which I really would like to emphasize with people in whatever career path you end up going on, whatever path your life takes you on, is I started to make connections. You know, I started to get to know people and people got to, you know, they, they got to know me and I was leading events and I, you know, and uh, I, I got a, a real sense of satisfaction out of working with the community. It, I mean, I could sleep at night again, you know, I was excited about the stuff that I was involved in, the people that I was, you know, meeting and, and working with uh, in the community. Uh, it just was so rewarding for me. And um, ultimately, as I, as I was finishing up college, finishing up, and college took me a long time, everyone, but finally when I was finishing up um, and uh, I majored in urban planning, um, I, uh, because of my involvement, I, I got plugged into the Arroyos and Foothills Conservancy. And um, I volunteered with them a lot. Uh, eventually I was an advisor to them, uh, basically for like community uh, involvement or, you know, development, I guess, uh, just, you know, um, volunteering and stuff. And, and, um, and then eventually I was on their board later when I was in college. And so that gave me a whole, you know, a different type of experience. And, uh, and I was very fortunate that because of all of these years of basically volunteering and getting experience and learning stuff, uh, I think the best way to learn, which is through experience and out in the field, um, you know, once I graduated, uh, even before I graduated, actually, they offered me uh, my current position, which really was kind of created for me. It was to, you know, oversee, uh, you know, events and make connections, you know, and uh, to connect the community with, with uh, the land. And it, it, the position's kind of just grown uh, and expanded since then. But uh, again, I'd really like to just emphasize, I volunteered for a lot of years and there were actually times where like my mom was kind of thinking like, what kind of a, a future could I have doing environmental work? Like there wasn't any sort of future in that. And now she's like one of my biggest supporters, you know, because she saw that uh, one thing led to the other, one, one thing led to the next, you know, and, and doors opened and opportunities came. 
And uh, so now I'm, you know, I, I feel like I have a really wonderful career with AFC. I love what I do. Um, uh, you know, I've gotten involved civically. I'm a, a city commissioner in Pasadena. So all that volunteering, all of that work in the community led me to, uh, you know, I feel very fortunate that I, I get to, you know, have a career uh, doing the type of work that I do. So that's kind of how it all happened. And I think there's some something in the chat I don't want to miss. Is it okay if I answer from Adriana? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so what are some of the obstacles that I face in my work? It's hard to imagine anyone wouldn't want to support this work. Oh, yeah, wow. Huh. Mm, well, I mean, with a nonprofit, one, one obstacle is always like, you know, trying to find sources of funding. So I've learned, uh, I've learned a bit of grant writing, which is very interesting, um, kind of the lifeblood of, of nonprofits. Um, you know, but there, ha there have been times where, where financially it's, you know, uh, you know, you have to get by as a nonprofit. Um, another thing is, is that we're, you know, we, we, we want to preserve natural open space. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to work with, uh, you know, landowners. Um, there's properties that we try to save that, you know, for one reason or another that we can't save. Uh, so those are some obstacles. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really think of anything like, like really, you know, like anything really bad or, or negative, but, uh, you know, there's definitely challenges. I mean, we have kind of a huge mission in that we're trying to save these places before they're gone. I, I mean, you know, sort of in the face of like relentless development. And so, um, you know, we, we've had to really try to be strategic about that and say, okay, we have like thousands and thousands of parcels, you know, talking of property. I mean, we have to work within the system that we're in and this is all, pri you know, much of this is privately owned property in the San Rafael Hills, even like in the Verdugos or, you know, and, and we have to be very strategic about how do we prioritize, how do we best sort of prioritize our, our efforts. Um, so what we focus on is uh, connectivity, like land that is essential for, you know, uh, wildlife connectivity, habitat, if it has water, um, you know, we have to really be strategic uh, because we only have so many resources. And I, I feel like we, we accomplish a lot for the amount of resources that we have. So I think probably the number one thing is just, it's, it's, it's resources to try to do what we want to do, which is save uh, and connect our remaining natural open space before it's gone. Um, and, you know, and we're always working on, on how can we better serve the community? How can we better connect with the community? Um, so those are challenges. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, I wanted to echo too what you were saying earlier um, about, you know, spending our time volunteering and, uh, <laughs> you know, we're very critical about um, nonprofits and we have had like bad experiences and then we had good experiences and especially you know that uh, just our labor right like especially for folks uh, people of color um, just the amount of labor you kind of have to get through just to build these networks in certain spaces and also knowing that like uh, oh anyways we like volunteering for for me and my experience was uh, definitely like learning these skills and then the networking and then especially for me now like i'm in a career with like uh well i don't want it to be a career right I'm trying to end homelessness like we want we want it to be gone like i eventually eventually want my job i don't want my to, job either joe i totally <laughs> understand <laughs> yeah. but it it did help volunteering and learning and meeting and so like while i was volunteering with you i was volunteering on skid row and just wanted to echo that too like that's something to share about folks who well, are yeah. interested in careers um you know, and, and if I could just, you know, kind of, kind of echo that again, like what you were saying, um, you know, and I know that the work that, you know, that uh, you and, and Teresa and the Regenerative Collective does, you know, very much, uh, you know, I know that you have like the blessing of like, you know, the, the uh, elders like um, Gloria Arianis. I know you're very much, you know, respectful and work with, you know, the native community, you know, uh, black indigenous people of color. And, and so, you know, I know that because, uh, because of the work that the Regenerative Collective does, I think I can, you know, I think it's worth mentioning, especially when it comes to challenges, really one of the biggest unanticipated challenges that, that I found, and I think you'll find this anywhere to navigate, is working with different people, people of different backgrounds, from different communities, 
and you're trying, sometimes you're not trying to accomplish the same thing, um, but you're trying to move forward, you know? And, uh, and it's, it's, it, I mean, especially in these times when I, I would say in broader society, there's, there's, you know, much more of this awareness, even like in corporate America for whatever that's worth, you know, it's, uh, there's much more effort or awareness or at least lip service being paid to issues of equity and inclusion and so on and so forth. Um, I, I found it, 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 you know, that is a, a difficult aspect of, of our work and with like any organization, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, there, you know, there can be, uh, there can be differences of, of, you know, opinions or experiences or whatever. And so it's, uh, you know, um, I think you find out anywhere you go. And especially for me, coming from like a multicultural background, I, a lot of times I can kind of see both ways. I can kind of see both sides. I'm like, okay, like I know why they feel that way, but this is really the direction I think things should go, you know, like this way. And so that, uh, navigating that, that, that has been challenging. That can be challenging. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, you know, and, it, and I mean, it's like you said, it's labor, right? But um, that can be a challenge, but it's, it's also like you said, Joe, it's, it's a skill. It's a skill that you learn with the experience, you know, working with other people, people from different backgrounds, you know? That's exactly. Uh, Clem asked, uh, how has this presidential administration affected your work and strategy? Uh, seems there are even more bold attacks on land and wildlife reserves. And then his next question is, is California doing any better? Is the Green New Deal any good? What's up, Clem? <laughs> anyway, uh, well, uh, you know, it's, it's we, we work very locally. So we actually have never received federal funding um, for any, anything that we've done. Uh, it's been like through the state, like California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, just one example, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, which are, that's a, a state agency. Um, so those are some like the, you know, sort of the government, you know, funds that, that we've received in the past for, you know, saving natural areas. Um, and so we, we really haven't identified, and this isn't exactly, you know, my realm, like with AFC, but but I do know that we, we haven't really identified any funding sources from like the federal government. So it, it hasn't, you know, the current administration hasn't really, I guess we're, we're kind of more on a local level. So, uh, you know, we have received funds from even like LA County and from, you know, uh, like I, I think there was a, a state Senator who, who, uh, you know, we worked with to help, uh, get funds to preserve 111 acres up in Big Tahunga Canyon, which I think Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy uh, is, is stewarding right now. Um, but, uh, you know, interestingly, this may not be what Clem wants to hear, but, you know, uh, this, I think it was, it was bipartisan. I, I haven't read too much into it, but we just put out in our, we put an email out about this. Uh, do you know what this new this new bill is, it's, I'll find it right now. It's this new federal, uh, it's, it's funding all of like the national parks and stuff like that. Um, I'll find it right now. Hold on, let's see. Oh, we didn't post it on here. Well, there was just some new wilderness kind of funding thing passed. It's gonna fund the forest service and everything. So we actually, I think we actually might be able to finally have a federal uh, source of funding. And I think that was bipartisan. I think it was like a Democrat and a Republican, you know, Congress people who, um, who both worked together to, to get that funding. I, I think what happened, and I forget the name of it, I hope maybe someone knows and they can type it in the chat. But um, I think what happened was, is that uh, revenues, that's the one, the Great American Outdoors Act, so uh, money that was supposed to be from, it's, you know, from oil and gas, it's not taxpayer money from what I understand, it's from oil and gas. Uh, it kept being redirected to other, other things, but it was supposed to be going into a fund to fund like our severely unfunded uh, national parks. And, you know, um, I think, you know, just protected lands basically throughout the country. And finally, they're gonna be using those funds to, uh, actually, actually fund uh, where it was supposed to go in the first place, which is like the national parks and stuff. And, uh, and we just sent like an email, like a, you know, breaking news type email blast out that we finally have uh, this as a, um, 
as a federal funding source. So uh, sorry, Clem, if uh, you're upset that Trump did something that's helping us. Um, but uh, we can give credit to those two bipartisan senators, I think. Um, but otherwise, besides that, it really, we're kind of way more local and also the community, the local community, uh, you know, they support us a lot as well. So we, we get a lot of uh, community support. Um, I don't know what, what the other parts of the questions were. Let me check. It's presidential administration. I mean, yeah, of course, the tax on land and wildlife reserves. Uh, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we, we purchase the land. Um, so it's not, you know, once we buy it, it's, it's ours, meaning that we're just saving it forever. Um, so it's not really affected after we do that. Is California doing any better? I mean, uh, you know, I, I've always kind of thought that there's, a, again, sort of a lot of talk and a lot of lip service about, oh, California is a state. We're like this such a progressive state. We're such a green state. Um, but, uh, I mean, personally, uh, you know, I think I I think we 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 really are, are falling behind. I mean, for for one example, uh, you know, rat poison, rodenticide. Um, there was a push, and actually, it's happening again. There's another push to to you know better regulate the rodenticide, the rat poison. I think there was a, a bill to like ban it in California. Democratic, you know, liberal progressive, so-called California, right? But what happened was the pesticide industry. Uh, this was a few years back. The pesticide industry with their lobbyists and all of their money were so powerful in California that basically it got, it got voted down or it got you know, shelved and it basically got killed. That bill did not go forward. So uh, you know, people might say, oh, California is so green and progressive, but this rat poison, which is working its way through the food chain, it's you know, getting coyotes and owls and mountain lions and all sorts of, you know, it's, it's killing them, it's, it's harming them, it's poisoning the whole food chain. California can't even ban that stuff. Um, so how progressive are we really? You know, I mean, and now there's questions about Nestle's water grabs in San Bernardino mountains. Uh, well, you know, there's water grabs and, and you know, basically uh, many of our local mountains. I don't work in the San Bernardino mountains, um, but here in our local mountains, I mean, like one place that, uh, that you know that we have preserved is uh, much of the mouth of Rubio Canyon in Altadena, and there's a water company up there, and they've basically uh, taken most of the water out of the stream. There's no surface flow, uh, and that's going to everyone's lawns and swimming pools and so on and so forth. So uh, you know that's something we'd like to work with them on and make sure that there's an environmental flow, make sure that there's water that can be on the surface for the wildlife and for people to enjoy and to keep the ecosystem healthy. So, uh, you know, from what I've read of what Nestle's doing, it sounds, yeah, it does sound reckless. It sounds actually like, uh, like it maybe just, you know, shouldn't be, obviously shouldn't be happening. Um, but that's not the area really where I work, but it's an issue really, and you'd be surprised in many of our canyons, they all kind of have their own water company and, um, I mean, yeah, a lot of our land is being sucked dry. And that's a whole other issue we could get to statewide is where does LA's water come from? I know Teresa and Joe do a lot of education about this, uh, about how basically, I mean, what, what we're trying to deal with as a conservancy is urban sprawl. But what makes that sprawl possible? Endless, you know, growth. It's, it's this, uh, you know, just this wasteful, this, this devouring natural open spaces, right? What makes that possible is that we're decimating other ecosystems. We're taking, we're drying up Owens Valley, right? And that, in, that uh, has negative impacts on the native people up there. We're, you know, sucking dry the Colorado River. We're, you know, we're taking from Northern California. So, um, you know, basically we're really ruining other ecosystems uh, to make, you know, to have LA on life support basically and, and make all of this crazy urban sprawl and, and wastefulness, really, if you look at our, our landscape practices, uh, possible. So, um, you know, that's really, you know, kind of at the root of a lot of it is water, actually, right? Water issues. I'm gonna turn on a light in here. Uh, let's see, what's their projected 
time to complete the building of wildlife corridors. Wow, well, you know, uh, I mean, we're, my boss John likes to say sometimes that we're in the business of forever. And what he means by that is that when we preserve natural land, we're saving it forever. Um, but really, I mean, I think our, our mission kind of goes on forever as well until we accomplish it. Um, you know, we're, we're trying really hard to connect up the San Rafael Hills with the Verdugo Mountains, because these places like we talked about in the, in the video are becoming like islands and they're being surrounded by more freeways and, you know, uh, sprawl, sprawl development. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, if some of these places do get choked off, that's really going to kind of mess up our whole mission. But we're, you know, we're, we're working really hard on trying to preserve uh, again, we have to uh, sort of prioritize and be strategic. And so we're trying to preserve those areas that are most, most critical for connectivity for the wildlife. After we accomplish that, um, then we can focus on expanding, you know, kind of trying to save more natural open space in the hills and stuff like around those connected areas and try to, you know, grow the, 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 however we preserve it. It's not always us purchasing. We could have a conservation easement. Uh, we could have, you know, maybe some other agency or entity or whatever, or they're the ones who end up conserving it. Um, but, but however it gets done, you know, we, we'd like to work to, to see it done and, and connect and preserve these most crucial places in our region uh, for nature, for wildlife, for biodiversity. Um, so it's kind of just ongoing, but we definitely do have a priority, which is connectivity. We have to connect these areas or else, you know, the rest is kind of almost futile. Um, as far as mountain lions are concerned, that's a different story because here in Southern California, especially in uh, like the uh, Santa Monica Mountains, I believe, uh, even maybe Griffith Park, like P22, who I think came from the Santa Monica Mountains, which is a little bit outside of our project area. Um, the scientists are saying that if we don't, yeah, and there they are, there's, so there's, uh, there's Griffith Park and you can see how it connects with the Santa Monica mountains right there. And so, uh, what they're saying about the mountain lions, especially in this mountain range here, yeah, where Topanga State Park is, all in there, is they're saying that if we don't create wildlife corridors and, and have more biodiversity and, and, and connect these areas, uh, by mid-century, so that's 2050, that's uh, 30 years from now, then mountain lions are going to be extirpated from uh, our region. So that means they're going to be locally extinct. So uh, especially when it comes to mountain lions, when it comes to creating connectivity for mountain lions, saving their habitat, that, uh, you know, it, it's, I mean, we have 30 years and they could be gone. Uh, and uh, something that maybe not a lot of people know is that the Los Angeles area is the only other mega city in the world that still coexists with big cats other than Mumbai, India, and they have tigers. So it's us and Mumbai, which I think is a pretty cool thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, as far as mountain lions, it, there, there really is a clock ticking for them. So here on the map, you can see uh, La Cunada Flint Ridge is right there. So the, there's the, north of that is the San Gabriel Mountains. South of that, you can see there San Rafael Hills. You have the two freeway in between the San Rafaels and the Verdugo Mountains. So that's one area that we're trying to connect for wildlife. You can see the San Rafaels and the Verdugos right there uh, south of Tahunga are, uh, you know, they, they're kind of like islands. You can see all the freeways surrounding them. You can see all of the sprawl surrounding them. Um, and so we're really trying to enhance or even create connectivity for the wildlife so we can link these islands and keep the wildlife, keep the plant life diverse, keep it healthy, because that's really one of the, the you know, wonderful things about our region where we live, the whole LA region, is that we're surrounded, we're nestled into all of this uh, amazing nature, you know, stuff that you'll find, plants that you'll find nowhere else on the planet. Um, and, and you know, amazing wildlife and, and beauty, and it keeps all of us healthy at the end of the day. So uh, that's this is really the region that we work in: is the Verdugos, the San Rafaels, and the San Gabriel Mountain foothills, and down the Arroyo Seco, even down to the LA River. Are there any more questions or comments or anything? Yeah, we have a question. Um... 
or kind of comment, uh, are we better off closing local national parks such as Angeles National Forest, et cetera, during fire season? Closing them? Um, well, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, is um, these, these mountains are surrounded by millions and millions of people. Um, so I'm not sure that we could close them. Uh, I mean, especially like when it comes to, when it comes to our protected lands, um, you know, when, when we get funding to, to save these, these areas, a lot of times that funding is, uh, it's de dependent on, on uh, access. You know, we say that there's gonna be public access and that's, uh, you know, sort of one of the conditions um, to, to get funding. But uh, so, you know, access is important. It's important for people. We can see now how actually desperately people are trying to access nature and the outdoors with, you know, the lockdowns and stuff that we've been having. So I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that, that stopping access for people to nature is, is uh, the best thing to do about fires. Um, if anything, we actually want to have, uh, you know, responsible access where we can uh, take people out to nature and make sure, especially the kids, have outdoor education, nature education, um, so that people know, uh, you know, why the land is special, how to take care of the land. And, and really, I think, in, in my opinion, um, and, and part of the work we do is, is what we call fire fuel reduction, which is trying to minimize the, the, the fuel and the conditions for these unnatural fires. Um, and, and at the same time, try to restore the habitat and make the land and nature healthier. Uh, you, you know, I think, um, I think actually much of the problem is that we being, you know, sort of our modern civilization have not taken care of the land. We've not taken care of nature. We've abused it. Uh, you know, this started 200 years ago when the Spanish came and there were millions of cattle and other grazing animals all around. And they overgrazed the native plants. They introduced non-native invasive grasses, which are uh, you know, they're annual grasses. They, they turn dry and dead every year. The, the mustard is another one that was introduced. Um, so those are the, the yellow flowers uh, on the mustard plants that you see in the springtime. They become a bunch of dry, dead brush um, around now in the summertime. And so it's actually disturbed land that was disturbed through, uh, you know, at first agriculture and grazing um, and then, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, development and stuff. When you disturb the land, that uh, offers the opportunity for these types of you know, invasive species to move in and to take over and to crowd out the native stuff, which is often you know, fire resistant, it's you know, climate resistant, drought tolerant. Um, and so really it's, it's uh, because we've disturbed nature so much that we've created these conditions for uh, wildfire really to take off. So what's the solution? Well, this is something that we're working on every single year and we have volunteers that work with us and maybe some of you would like to get some experience with us uh, out in the field um, is, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, get the conditions on the land as close to the native conditions as possible. Um, we, you know, we try to pull the mustard before it goes to seed and uh, so that way we're reducing the seed bank in the soil. We try to, you know, mow the grasses down, um, you know, mulch, uh, basically just encourage the native plants to come back. So there's you know, a variety of ways you can do that. But the problem I see in California in general is that nobody cares about the natural land. Nobody cares that the hills are dry and dead. And basically it's a decimated ecosystem. It, it's you know, the ecosystem, the biodiversity is gone in many of our areas. That's something called type conversion where uh, you used to have a really diverse uh, you know, plant community like chaparral, uh, you know, coastal sage scrub with dozens and dozens of many, many different species. And once those are disturbed and, you know, that maybe they burn too frequently and they're, you know, uh, basically they're disturbed and, and, um, and the invasives start taking over, they will then, you know, sort of take over and where you used to have, uh, basically the land transforms and it becomes like, almost like desertification. It becomes somewhere that used to be so diverse um, and perfectly adapted from millions of years of coevolution here in California, it becomes like a couple of different weedy species that just dry up and, you know, one cigarette, right, off the side of the road and what happens? It just, you know, bursts into flames, right? So you have massive fires, hotter burning fires, right? Faster moving fires. So uh, really, I think until people in California 
uh, you know, public officials, right? Anyone who's, uh, you know, supposed to be, uh, you know, taking care of land, which is, our, I think, all of our responsibility to whatever extent possible. Uh, you know, until people understand the land um, and understand why the invasive plants are harmful and why we need to try to, uh, you know, minimize those and, and uh, you know, try to bring back the native habitat. Until people understand that, um, I th and until people prioritize that, I, I, I think we're just going to keep having these same problems. And what uh, Teresa and Joe are bringing up right now are, you know, what we, what we need to do. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, Joe and Teresa, you, I know you both are, you know, well aware of this, is we need to learn from the indigenous people, from the native people, because California, uh, you know, all of uh, so-called North America, Turtle Island, right, was, was managed sustainably for many, many thousands of years. Um, these traditional, uh, you know, cultural burnings is, is one example of how, of how that was done. Uh, there's many examples of how the land was tended. And so there's, you know, uh, there's people out there who say, uh, you know, the wild land, the, the really the wilderness, the wild land is the land that is not tended anymore. It's the land that's just overgrown and, and full of weeds and it doesn't have that relationship with the people. And especially with the original people, it's become just overgrown and weeds. And that's why we have these fires. Uh, but if we can learn from the native people, if we can, uh, you know, uh, practice uh, more, you know, traditional um, land management, uh, you know, then I think that, you know, more so than trying to deprive people of access, I think that's what's going to help to to make uh, California healthy again and more fire resistant. And uh, so that's kind of like my long answer for that. <laughs> No, exactly. Thank you. Uh, a lot of our work, I mean, you know, um, well, first, you know, we call ourselves regenerative collective, but it's more of this concept that we always try to uh, bring about because, you know, the earth itself is a regenerative ecosystem. And then humans um, sort of lost this sort of coll collective effort. You know what I mean? We're consuming. Uh, there's this aspect of individuality, which we could get into. And so the, it's an aspiration for us to be function as a collective uh, regeneratively and that definitely you know helps us in terms of connecting back to our, in, our roots you know and understanding the indigenous uh, land management techniques that are that still continue to exist today so the work that you guys are doing is always connected you know you guys are always in our hearts uh, uh, with what, the efforts that we try to do even though our efforts might you know may seem small scale and all that it's part of that you know uh, uh, creating spaces for folks to learn about native plants um even if it just means like a curbside you know it could be that first uh experiential seed for them to like yo i want to get into this and we have we have many friends who you know from just gardening with us you know now have gotten jobs as like uh preschool gardener instructor instructors or they're taking internships in like land restoration projects or they're just going to pursue, you know, college, uh, um, wanting to study soil science and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, in general, it's just how do we continue to build this relationship with land and, and acknowledge that, you know, um, I mean, that we can, you know, in small to even large scale ways. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's exactly the right approach. Uh, you know, I've always been a big believer in, um, you know, acting locally, right. Uh, working where you're at in the local community. And, and I think that as, as you've seen with, you know, people, I mean, this has become jobs and careers and passions for people, you know, uh, when you do plant those seeds, when you do introduce people, uh, you know, to these things, um, you know, on the local level, I think it, it does have uh, broad reaching impacts and, and it ripples, you know, it ripples out. And so uh, I think the work that you all are doing, I think that approach is, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's really powerful. Uh, but, uh, Patricia asks, are there any native plants that you recommend for revitalizing the soil? Well, you know, something we see that comes up uh, naturally when, when the soil is disturbed, um, there's a few different ones. There's one called uh, deerweed, and that one has really beautiful uh, yellow flowers, and then they, they turn red, I think, after they're pollinated. Um, it's a legume, if I'm not mistaken, so it's in the pea family. And it fixes, that's the one, deer weed, and it fixes uh, nitrogen into the soil. So after, the, you know, the land burns or after it's otherwise disturbed, I've seen land that's been um, like graded for development. So bulldozers have come in 
or even like debris basins um, at the at the you know at the foot of a lot of our canyons in the mountains. Uh, the county flood control district has debris basins, and they'll bulldoze around you know maybe once a year. And this is one of the first uh, plants that you'll see pop up is is deerweed. Uh, there, yeah, it says so. It's in the legume family, so it's fixing nitrogen in the soil, which helps the other plants to sprout and to grow. Right, nitrogen helps them to grow, so it really helps the land to recover. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone sells deerweed anywhere. Um, it it kind of, you know, I see it just come up naturally on disturbed lands, and then uh, once it's kind of done its job, and the other coastal sage scrub or other type of habitat, you know, sort of starts to fill in, eventually the deerweed dries up and it dies, and it kind of just goes away. And if the land is disturbed again, the deer weed will, will come up again. So in nature, this is one that I see uh, really, um, you know, uh, in my experience, it's, it's a sign, it's a good sign as a native plant. That's, look how lush it comes in too, as this lush, you know, beautiful bush, right? It's a sign to me that the land is recovering, the land is healing, that, that the habitat is coming back. Um, it's a lot better to see this stuff than the mustards move in or something like that. Um, Another plant that I see uh, on disturbed lands that's native is the sacred datura, the toloache. Um, I'm not sure if that one plays a role in any sort of uh, you know, land recovery, but it does tend to come up a lot uh, with like the deer weed in uh, disturbed lands. Um, and it's a good one, it's a native plant. So I, I like to see it in areas where there's been disturbance. I like to see the sacred datura Toluaca, I never heard it said that way. Uh, Toluache, the sacred datura, jimson weed, datura ridia, so many names for this beautiful plant um, that we have to respect because it uh, it's, can be toxic. Uh, but you know, if you have, and I know that Teresa and Joe and you know, and probably you know, Clem and Kristen, I'm sure all of you with, you know, involved with the regenerative collective, I know you all have experience with um, you know, reg well, regeneration, regenerating land. And so if you're in the city somewhere, if you have a disturbed area of land, uh, whatever it may be, even if it's on the side of the road, like the, the parkway, you know, um, like on the curbside, right? Uh, I mean, what I might recommend in my, you know, just in the experience that I've had is doing something like sheet mulching or lasagna mulching, uh, getting cardboard, you know, putting that down, um, you know, putting a bunch of mulch on top. The cardboard is, you know, really uh, excellent for the mycorrhizal fungi to, you know, sort of start forming and breaking all that down into really, really rich soil. And so just putting down a layer of cardboard, keeping, suppressing the weeds down, uh, putting some mulch on top, that really will help you to create, you can create inches of just black, rich, beautiful soil. Um, and, you know, sort of help regenerate that topsoil that we're losing so much of. We're, we're losing so much topsoil uh, that's naturally formed by like the leaf litter and the logs breaking down and all of the stuff that you would find like on a forest floor. So this is something in the city, you can see that uh, down there, they're using it to replace a, or to really to cover up a lawn and to turn it into rich soil. Um, this is something I recommend that we do in the cities. Uh, there's Lee Adams, uh, other people are really, have been doing a lot of this in our region. Um, so there's a lot of wonderful resources, you know, how to learn how to do this type of thing. And, and Joe and Teresa can teach you. Um, and you can plant, you know, food plants, you can plant native plants. Uh, and, you know, maybe you could sheet mulch and then you could put native seed on top and see what sprouts up um, and, and regenerate the land that way. So there's a lot of options. I also want to highlight uh, this website, which we have linked on our um our Instagram page. Um, if you're just curious about understanding or wanting to know which plants are native to your area, wherever you live, uh, it's called calscape.org. Um, you can basically just type in your address and it'll give you a list of uh, plants and everything that grows native to your region. Um, before, before this website, I mean, I was just kind of like looking at the mountains that I live by or looking at whatever you know, based off what I've been taught, I'm like, oh, okay, this grows here, and I, I don't live too far from it, but having this website has been a great resource, um, and they also have, like, a, like a planting guide, which talks about, I believe, uh, yeah, nature restoration approach, which is, you know, we want to, we kind of just stopped using restore and call it regenerate, um, just, just philosophically, because, you know, we can't go back 
we can plant and produce and grow uh, in the present moment now. So this is a great a resource. So if you guys are curious, check it out, calscape.org. Awesome, good stuff. It's nice to talk with you all. So you know, I feel like we've been a, uh, at least on my end, I feel like you know it's 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 tough to not have the same human contact these days. <laughs> yeah, that's that's our nur that's our nourishment. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, Patricia asks, uh, how do you recommend protecting native seeds from being eaten by birds without plastic covering? Mm. Well, uh, it's funny. I mean, a lot of times, like I, you know, the, the native plants that I've gotten established in my yard from planting like one gallons and stuff, uh, I want the birds to eat the seeds, you know, because that's habitat. Um, but uh, I mean, they will eat some of your seeds if you're just tossing them out there, like wildflower mix or something. But I mean, I, I've personally had a lot of really good luck just with a like a mulched area, like somewhere where I, you know, dump a lot of my leaf litter and stuff like that. I've just tossed a bunch of seeds out in these types of, you know, these areas. And um, I guess enough of them sort of get, you know, buried underneath the leaf litter and stuff um, that uh, they, you know, when they get some rain, they end up sprouting, you know, they end up germinating. So um, I don't know, Joe, Teresa, do you have any advice for that type of thing? If you're trying to, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of lazy. I just throw seeds and I just see what comes up and I might get some yarrow coming up. Uh, I might get white sage, um, sagebrush. I might get different things coming up. Uh, poppies, of course, you know, but um, Teresa and Joe, do you have any sort of advice on, on that kind of thing? Like just seeds, doing it by seed? Um, I've propagated seeds mostly using um, trays and um, those small pots. So um, sometimes like I've, I've thrown poppy seeds um, and I've seen them, them sprout up. That's so, the, the surefire way is, is using like a seed flat or a little, you know. Yeah. Seed, right. Yeah, I think so. But I agree that um, like areas, my mugwort seems to just really spread. Um, I think if there's enough covering on the ground to protect the seeds from um, the birds, then there's more of a chance of them coming up. Mm -hmm. And then I guess if you have cats, <laughs> you know, maybe that might be a a predator for the birds if they're coming trying to eat all your seeds but yeah i'm like you like if they're, they're gonna come and eat then i'm just gonna let them and maybe you know it gives me an excuse to want to plant more you know so more than they can chew um yeah but it, it, it's i think that's a really good uh thing to bring about is you know i've heard of like folks that do like zen gardens like who are really in, embedded in that culture um they would like sit on the land for like days and like meditate before they even um before they even plant anything and i i have this book called regenerative gardening and he even talks about that too like understanding the land when it's at night understanding what's in the morning understanding it when it's in the daytime and like just seeing and witnessing all the animals and the life that comes about uh to because because i mean we can give recommendations but I think it's in terms of the regenerative approach, uh, everything's really specific to where we're at. You know, um, we had a garden uh, uh, planting that we done in Alhambra, and um, I noticed one day that the that the mailman <laughs> walks by, so he walks through the garden, and I was like, oh, like oh no, we're gonna have to do something about that. So we created an intentional like pathway because you know we're like, well, I don't want to. I don't want this uh, this person to get mad or upset, you know, who knows. Um, so just stuff like that. You just realize like, Oh, you, you just kind of yeah. have to get creative. And um, yeah. That's, <laughs> a, that's a cool example. I, I, I get it. Um, we, we found that with trees actually. And I'm sure it's the same with, you know, native plant seed. Just if it actually does take out, out on the land, you know, uh, but especially with trees, we found um, that, you know, we've, we planted actually hundreds of trees, like in one gallon pots or even smaller oak trees and other stuff you know and uh 
it's just really hard to keep them alive. You know, we don't have a really great success rate doing it that way. Even if we're trying to keep them watered regularly, it's, it's tough trying to get them through these summer months. But uh, what we found is that if stuff sprouts naturally, if you plant some acorns, uh, you know, by the time that little oak tree is just you know, a few inches up off the ground, that taproot is like a foot deep, you know? So um, much more resilient uh, coming up that way, uh, you know, naturally, right? So makes sense. Karina asked the question saying, um, I'm having a hard time convincing my neighbors here in East LA to start Native Gardens. Any suggestions on how to help change their minds? Um, my, my background was in psychology actually, and I really got interested in like conservation psychology, uh, you know, things like putting, like, like putting trash cans, I guess, or putting whatever you can for people to throw their waste, like little stuff like that. How can you quote unquote, like manipulate the environment to uh, uh, promote certain positive behaviors. And um, honestly, it was just starting a garden where I was at um, in Alhambra, my parents' place, uh, starting the little native garden there about three years. You know, now it's all blooming. Now everything's huge. I had that conversation with my neighbor, but they were just like, eh, it's, gonna t it's too much maintenance and all this, despite the fact that... <laughs> they water their lawn and the lawn looks terrible. I mean, it's, it's dried up and then the water ends up going on in concrete anyways. So I'm like, yo, like I, I'm, I'm willing to do all your landscaping for free. Um, but I think my route was just hitting up the next neighbor. And then, so we have a neighbor down the street who converted their garden to um, both what we call like drought tolerant, right? Like the mm -hmm. succulent, but they also put in some native plants there that we gave them. And then I have another neighbor, uh, who I was talking about uh, where the, the, the mail carrier was coming in and walking through the garden, uh, that whole space. And it's probably been, it's almost going to be a year, but that whole space is all the native plants are blooming. The white sages that we planted there, are like they're like nine feet. I don't know. The shoots go like nine feet high. It is, it's just crazy. But um, it's just, I think for me is the, the approach of just finding who's down to plant natives in the area and eventually, you know, you can only hope that the person's going to be like, hmm, there might be something onto this, you know, and it will take time, it will take years. But, you know, just like, um, just like the work that Tim's doing and all that, like, it, it, it gives us an opportunity for us to have these conversations and plant those seeds. So uh, I've noticed that my neighbor, uh, my parents' neighbor right next to us, uh, that he's a little more curious about it. And especially when we keep reminding him that, um, that the plants will be free. Uh, there, there's also the idea like, yo, your property value will sometimes increase with certain plants. Um, there was a group called turf terminators. Uh, they didn't do so well, but they, uh, they were helping folks, um, through a uh, rebate. Uh, uh, they were getting paid by the rebate and converting people's, uh, lands to uh, uh, drought tolerant, right? So they're saving water. The homeowners are saving water. They're saving money. Um, and sometimes the, because of the plants being there, it adds, um, it adds a value to the property that they're on. I think for like oak trees, it's like $10,000 or something that the property value raises. Um, so these are just certain like, you know, uh, rhetorical <laughs> uh, uh, strategies you can use to kind of convince uh, people. Um, either they care about the money, they care about their water use, they care about aesthetics. Um, so just throwing that out there. Yeah, and I would add, um, if you have access to any of those plants um, in your own garden, if you like um, gather like a little bit, you know, a leaf or two and share it with your neighbor and have them smell it, um, that usually, I think, especially, especially with a lot of the sages, I think a lot of people build connection with the plants. I know I do through the scent. And then um, you can, they can see it and touch it. And you can talk a little bit about it. And sometimes that'll help them build a closer relationship with the plants and why it would be good for them to grow those native plants. Yeah, I think a big part of it is that uh, people actually have to have to see like, 
you know, they, they have to kind of see, well, see the plants, smell the plants, see what they look like, right? It's, it's sort of that, that contact, I think. So, yeah, I agree. And also, um, I mean, if your neighbors are in East LA, like let them know, you know, that's, that's our catchment area. You know, we, the, we want to keep things hyper local and we want to scale the work. Right. Um, and so we want to distribute plants for free to folks that are in East LA, Northeast LA and San Gabriel Valley. And I'm happy that, you know, uh, within these past few months, we've been getting hundreds of donations of native plants. Um, people like, uh, or, Large companies like uh, Theater Pain Foundation has donated plants recently, uh, Artemisia Nursery, um, and then our friends who cultivate native plants in their areas, like our friend Chase in San Diego, who's going to come again, donate lots of plants. So uh, it's just sort of our approach in being as anti capitalist, but also embracing like mutual aid uh, 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 strategies because we feel like the plants need to be there. You know, they need to be put back, they need to be put back into the land. And well, that's um, a great way to do it. Yeah. It's free plants. Who, do, who doesn't like free plants, right? <laughs> They're like 10 bucks, 15 bucks sometimes for just one plant, you know? I know. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I saw something. This is another suggestion. Where was it? Um, from Patricia that, you know, talking about, you know, trying to sell people on like the, the butterflies, the pollinators, you know, that might be, that might be something, uh, telling people, you know, Hey, I mean, you like birds, you like butterflies. Right. Um, I also wonder about, uh, stuff that, you know, I know that you share a lot, uh, Teresa, which is, um, like human uses, like letting people know that, you know, these plants are medicinal that you can cook with them. Right. Uh, building the relationship that way. Um, maybe that's another way. Maybe your neighbor could come visit our nursery in El Sereno sometime and come check out the plants. Hey guys, this is Karina. Thank you. Yeah, um, the main complaints I get are, you know, they, the, the time, like to establish them, you know, like to water them. And then the other second complaint I get is, get is that, um, they look ugly in the summer. <laughs> um, so, you know, I tried to like tell them, you know, there's some that you can get that are evergreen that, you know, uh, that'll look nice during the summer and it'll only take about like a year to establish them. And it's just like overall, like not interested. Um, and I think that the main thing the whole process of getting started, that's what is kind of overwhelming, you know, like to get rid of their, you know, colonizer grass and um, just, you know, uh, do the work basically. So, um, yeah, and I've talked to Joe and Teresa about this before we met before and we're trying to kind of I'm part of an environmental justice group and trying to, you know, go at it at that angle, like trying to partner up with people from different organizations to kind of also provide education to, to you know, to people. Because um, I, I think at this point, it's just me trying to convince other people in my neighborhood to do it. And um, I think that as a group, we could be a little bit more powerful. Do you have, yeah. uh, Karina, do you have any like demonstration projects anywhere in your area? Um, not that, I mean, I know that uh, there's there are some native gardens like in East LA, but I haven't visited them myself. Um, you mean like training, like how to, how to plant? I mean, just like, I mean, uh, just like it doesn't even have to be like a, a big garden or anything. But I mean, if if you just even have like one person's, you know, part of their yard or you know, a one parkway or uh, just one area, like one strip of land somewhere that you could plant up uh, in a way so that you could bring 
you know, nearby locally, right? Your neighbors yeah. and the other people that you're trying to work with and say, hey, see, like, and, and like Teresa was saying, like, have them smell the plants, have them see the plants. Like Joe was saying, like, actually show how beautiful this landscape can be. Um, because I think when people see it, when they smell it, then they're more likely to like to get it, you know? And yeah. um, so probably if I were, you know, in your position, and I know Joe and Teresa and many others on this call, would be really, you know, more than willing to, to help you and work with you. Um, but, you know, if you could try and find one place kind of in your, in the area where you're trying to work, uh, you know, near your neighbors, right? And plant up just like one plot, like one area where you could plant it up and have it just look, you know, look the way you want it, look beautiful, right? Yeah. And, and attract all that life, right? Like, I, I think kind of like, you know, maybe like sort of what we're all getting at in this conversation is it like, uh, you know, that's kind of what does the trick, you know, is people, they, they have to see it to get it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I have a native garden. I have a front, all of the, my whole front garden um, yard it, are natives and my backyard, it's all natives. Oh, so, well, it sounds like people should come to your house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like my, for example, and I hate to take up all this time, I'm sorry, but like my neighbor in the front, you know, I mean, obviously, they see the garden my garden and you know i've tried to convince them i'm like i'll do it for you and they're like no you know I, i'd rather have something that is going to give me something in return and i'm like it is going to give you something in return it's going to help you know restore the land and it's going to help you know you bring in some wildlife you know yeah. But yeah, it's just, it's really hard to convince, convince him. And then I've approached other people too. And then they just, just not, not into it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, some people um, are just never going to be interested in this kind of thing. And that's okay. You know, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I kind of agree with what Joe was saying, trying to find the people who are interested. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, there are many uses, uh, for native plants um, that are good for people, right? Like, the, you know, like you could plant things that are edible, you could plant, you know, medicine, uh, especially in these times, there's a lot of like immunity boosting, you know, native plants. Um, so, you know, but some people maybe just are never gonna be interested in that. So it's probably all about just trying to find the, I'm sure there are plenty of people who are, you know, plenty of people who, um, who, are, who would be interested. So maybe it's yeah, about just think, trying I, to work with yes, them. Just keep searching. Yeah. Yeah. Keep Good asking, part. keep searching. Yeah. Let, us know if, uh, let us know if you need any help. Yeah, thank you guys. I like, um, <laughs> well, first of all, I was kind of learning because it sounds like, uh, <laughs> uh, like we're like trying to uh, heal, help with a relationship. Because it is, I mean, and the whole field of like environmental psychology or this emerging like conservation psychology, um, it will bring out, uh, they have some terms called like, uh, I don't know, what was it called? Environmental destructive disorder or something like that. Um, because I mean, I think, you know, realistically when we see people throwing away trash and just not caring about the land, like, you know, I, I feel it's just the same as any other mental health disorder. Um, and I work in a, at, at a psychiatric facility. So, you know, I see, and I witness because of, uh, of uh, working with the uh, houseless population, um, how the environment does lead to um, uh, certain, you know, it does promote certain behaviors. Uh, it, says, it does things to our mental health um, and our ideology. So I like that we're even incorporating this talk um, and how do we, you know, how do we heal each other? How do we work with each other and our local neighbors? Um, one of the things that I remember from uh, in English class that, uh, you know, me and Clem, <laughs> uh, we had a professor and uh, we, we, uh, we were part of this critical theory club. And he always said, when you're writing your paper, you want to, you want to, you want to recognize the audience that you're writing your paper. So for me, it's like recognizing the audience that these plants may be presenting themselves to and when I'm writing a paper I don't want to write my paper to people that don't care about my paper like he said always said disregard the recalcitrant right so it's like people that are having an obstinately uh, uncooperative attitude towards um, 
whatever you're bringing right i don't um but there'll be people there's there's always an ethos right there's always a way in which we can uh i guess showcase or present something um that is appealing and all that and we're not trying to manipulate it but you know or be manipulative but we you know there there is a there is something that these these plants have you know attracted me towards and building that relationship with this land so um mm -hmm. a lot of it had to do with like mental health like i i for myself it was very therapeutic uh working with the land and you know um because of colonization and the fact that many of us are relocated human beings um building that relationship with the land really helped bring, bring in this sense of place the sense of belonging to the local community that you know Teresa and i always share our stories right of colonization and how we were brought here um and how our families and that historical trauma and you know we want to we we have to acknowledge that we are rooted to these lands even though we might not be indigenous to this land we are finding our roots and we want to build those roots in a non-invasive way um so you know that that might not be the approach that many other people who garden around us uh, are, are thinking but you know there's always ways in which we can um uh, I guess present these plants and have be, be advocates for it uh, to help uh, uh, restore you know local uh, ecosystems. So um, that's just part of it. You know, there's no clear cut answers, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious too to know if your neighbor like what kind of plants that they do prefer. I mean, if it's growing food, you know, we're down with that too, and we, we can like you can see how your native plant garden can help you know have this symbiotic relationship with even non-native but you know ho hopefully non-invasive uh, plants that do grow food so i'd be curious about that uh yeah i think uh he has a fruit tree in the front um so i think that's that's what yeah basically what he's getting to like something at all like food and yeah i should have told them that there's that option too um so yeah you're right there's different angles to um try to you know uh get people to do things differently um yeah i'll, I'll go ahead and let him know that and see see what he says mm -hmm. do you have any uh i know tim you know you, you have an amazing food garden in your own space uh what a in your area, I mean, what do you see? Do you have any recommendations of certain plants? I know you do the Tres Hermanas uh, uh, planting as well, and that's been amazing. So do you have any uh, insight on that? What are some good well, plants? I try. To I, I try. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's still, of course, trial and error. Um, some things are successful and work great, and, you know, some things I'm, you know, I'm learning. But, uh, you know, the native plants, for sure, um, you know, they, they bring in the, the pollinators. They, you know, attract all the native insects. And so generally just promoting that biodiversity with, you know, the native plants helps to keep, uh, you know, it's the checks and balances with like the insects, right? Like if you have, um, and this is actually what companion planting does, which is what you show here with like the Milpa, the three sisters um, approach, uh, which is, you know, like the traditional, you know, uh, native, uh, you know, Mesoamerican, uh, you know, farming approach, agriculture. Um, but here where we live, incorporating a you know, native garden, native plants around or in with our fruit trees or our food plants helps to attract that, that diversity of insects, right? Insect diversity, and then that attracts the birds. And the, you know, so there's all these checks and balances happening that makes it so that one species doesn't take over. One species you know, doesn't gain the upper hand and sort of you know, get out of balance, right? And so, um, uh, that might be another thing for people who are interested in, uh, you know, growing food is attracting pollinators. Uh, I think I've read something that like tomatoes, for instance, are, you know, the, um, I guess mostly pollinated by like native bees, actually, which makes sense because they're, they're related to the nightshade, right? So they're, they're a native, uh, you know, they're, they're a native North American or Mesoamerican, um, you know, food crop. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, kind of the the health of the the land it, it impacts the health of your your food garden right um that might be one other angle for for the neighbor yeah we uh even pomegranate i don't know i just been wanting to plant a pomegranate tree 
uh, lately. And I know they do pretty well in the summer and stuff. So um, same as like uh, I've seen banana trees around a lot. There's a lot of grapes, not native grapes. There's a lot of, uh, I think it's Spanish grape or something, but nearby that my neighbors plant, I mean, my whole block is almost planted of all grapes. Um, fig trees, right? Those were, those were fun growing up. Uh, all those June bugs <laughs> and beetles. Um, yeah, there's tons. I mean, it's just, it's just like, you know, food is important too. And, you know, a lot of the work that I, I do with people experiencing homelessness is I would like to grow food plants everywhere around the area, Northeast LA, East LA, San Gabriel Valley, just to give that access. Um, the carob tree is somewhere I see sometimes too, right? I think that's what it's called. But uh, yeah, avocados I've seen, you know, those as well. Lemons, oranges. Yeah, it's awesome stuff. We got to, you know, we got to support the human habitat as well, right? Guavas. Tahare says guavas. <laughs> uh, Tahare just joined us. Uh, she's been, um, uh, she had led two uh, talks around composting, vermicomposting. Uh, right now we're just kind of talking about, you know, um, Tim gave a presentation about the Royals and Foothills Conservancy, what they do to help protect the, the mountains. And also, you know, we're having a conversation about local like efforts, like even just convincing our neighbors to grow native. Um, what are certain ways, what are certain plants that we can grow? Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at in the conversation. Um, feel free to mute yourself if you want. Anyone too, like if you want to jump in, uh, there's, there's not too many people here, so it's fine. Tim, did you, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I also missed some of the, unfortunately I had to handle some personal stuff, but I missed some of the talk about the Foothills work and the Royal work. And I don't know if Tim, if you don't mind kind of giving a, or if anyone doesn't mind kind of giving a quick summary or talking points, I'd really appreciate kind of knowing what was talked about. Um, I really was hoping to learn more about that. Um, I know you already went through it, but even just a few important points, I would really appreciate hearing. Yeah, no, all good. Um, I mean, basically, I just, uh, you know, I, I introduced um, the organization I work for, which is Arroyos and Foothills Conservancy, a nonprofit land conservancy, and we work in the uh, San Gabriel Mountains, uh, San Rafael Hills, Arroyo Seco, Verdugo Mountains region um, to uh, preserve natural open space. Uh, and, and a big goal of ours is, is to connect the natural open space with wildlife corridors. We have our website pulled up right now. So you see the beautiful mountain lion right there, but there's you know, all wildlife. We're trying to connect it uh, to keep the wildlife healthy and diverse, um, to keep the, you know, the plant ecosystem healthy and diverse. Uh, and, um, and a big part of, especially my job is, is working to connect our protected lands with the communities that we serve. So we do that through, you know, we get people involved in uh, the stewardship of the nature preserves. We do, uh, you know, a lot of uh, outdoor or nature education, field trips, uh, docent led tours, um, you know, a lot of ways that we're trying to connect uh, the communities that we serve uh, with our, our protected lands. So here, this map that was just brought up, this is great. I wanted to bring up this map today. This shows our regional initiative, which is what we call the Hahamungna Tutahunga Wildlife Corridor. Uh, and this seeks to connect a 20 mile long wildlife corridor starting up in the Hahamungna Watershed Park area of, of the Arroyo Seco in Pasadena, just right up against um, the San Gabriel Mountains. And connect that up and down the Arroyo Seco, which goes all the way down to you know, the LA River, into the San Rafael Hills, which are there uh, in between Pasadena, uh, Eagle Rock, um, Glendale, and connect those uh, underneath, you know, across the two freeway um, into the Verdugo Mountains. You can see the San Rafael Hills and the Verdugo Mountains are, are surrounded by freeways and urban sprawl. So they're becoming like islands of habitat where wildlife can't very easily get in or out. So we really wanna uh, enhance and, and secure the, um, the, the connectivity for these areas, kind of string them together uh, so that you know, there can be passage. And then we'd like to link back up into the San Gabriel Mountains up at Big Tahunga Canyon. So connect the Verdugo Mountains back with the San Gabriels. And then we even have 
uh, you know, our goal is to, to connect up with Griffith Park, which is where the famous uh, Hollywood mountain lion is, P22. Um, so get him out of there before he tries to cross the 101 or do something like that again. Uh, and then there's other groups that are working to try to connect up uh, Griffith Park with like the, um, the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, so this is generally, um, you know, the, the region where we work in. Uh, so again, you know, going from basically the LA River through Northeast LA, uh, up the Arroyo, Hahamanga, uh, San Rafael Hills, uh, Verdugo Mountains, and over into like the Tahunga area. Um, so that's generally what we do. And uh, the good news is, is that uh, this talk is recorded. So when you're driving or, I don't know, cooking dinner, you, could, you can replay and hang out with all of us all over again. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Sure thing. <clears throat> Tim, I have a question for you. Hi. Okay, Tahari, how are you? Nice to hear your voice. Nice to see your face and hear your voice. I'm good, thank you. I uh, wanted to ask you, I know you bring school groups into these areas and you, you educate them. How would you be able to use any of these areas to actually do schooling right now, outdoor schooling? Uh, actually, <laughs> um, that's something we're just starting to explore yes. um, because, uh, well, because of the way things are going, it doesn't look like kids are going back to the classroom anytime soon. Correct. Um, so there are other people who are interested in doing this in the community. And so I don't know if you and I have maybe been on some of the same Facebook chats or emails, uh, but that's something that we're going to be looking into. Uh, we do have an outdoor classroom area up at the Rosemont Preserve. Um, so, you know, there are some areas that, that we could do outdoor education for relatively, you know, small groups. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's something we're exploring. Okay, and who are you having these conversations with? Because no, I'm not part of it, and I would. Oh, I'll, I'll link you in. I, I, I think it's I forget uh, what what's her name. It's uh, she she runs the um, Bio Citizen Summer Camp. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. And uh, there's a bunch of other people who are tagged, and I, I haven't I just haven't had time to to engage yet this week. Um, but I will make sure that you are plugged into those conversations. Uh, uh, yes. Another thing I, I, I should I should bring up really quick uh, that, that um, Joe and Teresa are reminding me of is what we are doing right now are virtual field trips. So if you go to our website, which is up on the screen right now, arroyosfoothills.org, mm -hmm. under like education or field trips, we have our virtual field trips. Also, on if you search us on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, and we've been uh, basically we've been adapting our normal field trip curriculum to a video format. We've been making these really awesome videos mm -hmm. to support teachers, to support students who are learning from home mm -hmm. and provide that nature education, get them out into the field. And we've done videos on native plants, right. uh, on wildlife. And we just uh, actually just released a video on geology, which, which mentioned uh, how earthquakes happen. And mm -hmm. that was literally like that night we had, remember that earthquake? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We had an earthquake that night, like the, the day after or the night after we, we released our, our mm -hmm. most recent geology video. And we have other videos in the works uh, that we're working on that are, you know, they're going to be um, you know, basically being released throughout the whole year because we're going to be in this for a while, so uh, we're we're trying our best to support, uh, you know, teachers and students and even just the community with nature education, outdoor education, um, okay. uh, virtually at this point as well. Thank you. It's good to know. And Tahare would be an amazing instructor for that as well. So it's a shout out. Um, I'm glad that we're all here. Like it's been a while, so uh, this is cool. Um, Tim. Um, is there any way for folks to uh, who want to support the efforts, these efforts, um, volunteering, connecting, any gaps that you might see being filled? I know we talked about, you know, um, sometimes, you know, there's encampments in certain areas. Uh, and, and me, I could bring, provide a skill set with like providing people that are houseless, staying up in, in areas because I already do in like Ernest Epps Park and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been able to build that relationship with Marcos Trinidad and Anytime he sees a homeless encampment there, um, I've been like happy that I've been able to fill that gap. Um, but if there's anything like your kind of opportunities that already exist and then opportunities that potentially like you might think of in the future. 
Um, yeah. And, and, you know, Joe, you'll be the first person I call if, if anything, you know, if I need anything, uh, you know, like, like the work that you do. Um, but, uh, you know, right now we, we normally have um, restoration days or volunteer days uh, at, you know, a couple different properties. We actually have been working on setting up regular volunteer days uh, once a month at some of our different properties. We have uh, Millard Canyon up in Altadena, Rubio Canyon, again in Altadena, Cottonwood Canyon in Pasadena uh, near Hahamunga, near the Rose Bowl. Uh, we have a preserve, uh, the Rosemont Preserve in La Crescenta. So uh, it's, you know, mostly up in the foothills in these areas, um, if anyone, you know, would like to get out in, into those areas. Uh, but right now, um, we're trying to follow some of the county guidelines and, um, you know, keep more current information on our, on our website. So we're going to be updating the website, um, but we're, we had to cancel our volunteer days just because of distancing and stuff like that. Um, but we will be bringing them back and doing it outdoors and responsibly, probably relatively soon. Um, so you can always go on our website and check the calendar, arroyosfoothills.org, uh, check the calendar. Um, and that's one way to, uh, you know, keep posted. We also do have uh, other events, like at Rosemont, we open the gate up once or twice um, a month because we share an entrance with the county. So it's like, like controlled access, but uh, we open it up for the community a couple of times a month, usually on the weekends, there's one open gate down there. So that's kind of all we're doing up there right now. Rubio Canyon's always open. Millard Canyon is kind of, uh, you know, a hidden little spot, but it's always open. Um, so uh, you can always come out for an open gate. Um, when school does, when field trips do happen again in the field, uh, we, we have a very uh, generous uh, family foundation uh, who um, are, are funding a, a grant for us to uh, provide buses, to provide free transportation to get uh, schools, to get uh, you know students out into our preserves for uh, field trips, and so if anyone has kids or is a teacher and would like to you know take advantage of that and schedule a field trip, they're all free. Um, and if you need the transportation, we we can provide the transportation. That's something to look for in the future. Uh, if anyone lives uh, near the area or has a special connection to one of these places like Rubio Canyon or you know, uh, some of the areas that we, um, you know, help, help to preserve, uh, we have friends groups. And so if you're interested, you could you become a friend. Uh, and, and for anything else, I mean, uh, you know, I think you link to my Instagram and to AFC's Instagram, you link to our website, you can always sign up uh, for a volunteer or send me a message or send us an email, uh, however you want to get in touch. And, um, and we will, I mean, these days, it's a little bit tough, things being the way they are but we can always definitely try to, you know, get people involved and, you know, just uh, be on the lookout when the world gets a little bit more back to normal. Uh, you know, we do have events where you can come out and, uh, you know, you can learn from Joanna Turner, who was in the video, how to, how to track wildlife. Uh, you can learn about native plants with Rich Toyon, uh, who uh, was in our native plant video, who's one of our docents. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities. You can learn about geology. You can uh, come out and, and uh, go on a docent tour. You can come out and volunteer. Uh, we do scout projects with, you know, the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and stuff. So there's uh, lots of opportunities normally, um, but, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and the website are, are probably the best ways to, um, you know, stay in touch with us. So thank you. Mm. Thanks for all that. Tim, all this land where you are doing conservancy work, it belongs to LA County or to Pasadena and La Cruz? Uh, who does it, which, which city or which county does it belong to? We, uh, well, our, our preserves, uh, we, we purchased them. Our, our conservancy purchased the, the private land in order to preserve it forever. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's owned by Arroyos and Foothills Conservancy. A lot of our nature preserves that you see mm -hmm. uh, here on the map where all the trees are. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, some of the lands, we, we help to preserve them through, uh, you know, information or funds that we help get or, you know, some of our data or, you know, uh, other means. Um, so those are AFC supported properties. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, there's a bunch of land up in, in Tahunga Canyon that we help, we help to preserve. Uh, so mostly our properties are, you know, we're trying to either, you know, purchase uh, natural land is to save it um, and restore it or we otherwise try to preserve land by you know uh, having uh, like property owners uh, 
agree to a conservation easement um, so that, you know, they can agree that, you know, they won't uh, develop or they won't close up the land for the wildlife, uh, stuff like that. So um, mm -hmm. there's different ways that we try to make sure that land can stay natural and open. Mm -hmm. Are you still working in Altadena behind that small little house? Are you still considering starting a nursery there? Or oh, well, a nursery might be cool someday. And, and we, you know, we are, we do have a proposal that we are slowly working on um, that I hope we can make progress on uh, that ultimately in maybe a few years, we'd like to create a little education center, a little nature education center up there at Rubio Canyon um in uh in Altadena yeah so it's just somewhere where we can do programs even like talks like tonight right right so that's that's another goal of ours yeah so okay that's that's still there okay yeah it is that's good good to know um hmm. Clem asked uh he said would AFC be interested in starting community land trust question mark well, you know, I know that you all have done a lot of research into a community land trust. I'm not sure exactly uh, what that what that means, um, or you know how how we could be involved in something like that. Um, I mean, we we are a land trust that's made up by the community, and our purpose is to save natural land, save natural you know nature, basically open space. Uh, I'm sure there's a better word we can use than open space, right? Because it's full of life. It's full of, you know, habitat. But, um, and, you know, we want to connect the surrounding communities that we serve. We want to connect, you know, people with these lands, right? So in that sense, I mean, that's kind of what we do, what I do with my job. Uh, I, I would have to learn more about, and maybe you all could fill me in on what a community land trust mean. My my impression of that is is like people kind of joining together. Well, that's kind of how AFC started, really. But you know, people joining together and maybe having land for like farming or you know for communal living. Uh, we did look into years ago the the possibility of doing like uh, community gardens, um, stuff like that. You know, buying land for community gardens or otherwise, you know, saving land so that people could you know, grow food and vegetables. And I think ultimately as, as the years have gone by and our mission has sort of uh, become you know, more clear, more focused, and that is, uh, you know, habitat, wildlife, more like natural land. Um, I personally would love if we had a community garden, I'd be there all the time. It would, you know, I, I would love the community, but, you know, we try to build a community, but it's more, uh, you know, for taking care of uh, natural land. Um, I could I could see a partnership in um, or a symbiotic relationship uh, uh, between you know those areas where the freeways are existing and all that. Um, we are are part of a, a community land trust in East LA, and you know some some land trust community land trusts right. Uh, the difference is that there is a housing component to it. Um, the land is, is basically like the like a roof a rose and foothills the nonprofit will own it and so the property um, meaning like the house or the building will be more of an asset so um, you know like every nonprofit provides some public good so in the community land trust the public good will really be um, housing low income affordable housing I like saying low income because affordable that word gets thrown around but if Mm. It, it's it's taken from the market rate so yeah. <laughs> by definition market rate housing in los angeles which is based off uh the averages of what what things are cost now based off the market um it's like it's very expensive so low income specifically right and um usually in community land trust uh specifically uh eco villages um which are community land trusts but they have more of intention which is like growing food communal uh, responsibility, right? They're growing, uh, they might have a farm, it might be a, a, a community support of agriculture. So like a CSA, which is mm -hmm. that they, the, they sustain themselves um, financially through uh, providing food that they distribute to the local areas. Um, but an idea too is, is uh, a community land trust that has a native plant nursery component to it, right? Where just like how, um, where we met at and uh, with the Hahamanga nursery, like you know, those plants are being distributed to locals. And in that way, the money kind of helps serve um, 
or sustain the organization. So, I mean, that might be an idea, you know, within these areas that are uh, surrounding the, uh, like the freeways um, that, that are creating like these islands uh, and sort of severing that, uh, that bridge between the, uh, the natural areas. Uh, I mean, these are definitely low income areas as well. So maybe in the future, you know, seeing a community land trust that has a native plant nursery component to it that contributes in this large scale, you know, wildlife corridors uh, uh, project. So just throwing an idea out there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love, uh, I love how that's, you know, it's so not, it's almost like multi-benefit, right? It's like a, it's like a multi-benefit, like a holistic type approach. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I fully support uh, all those, all those, you know, uh, ideas. I, I kind of, I kind of, uh, I think it's a little disappointing that like people need to create a land trust like that to have, you know, low income housing, to have these types of, you know, all these really great things you were talking about, like CSA, Eco Village, or whatever, like, you know, I, I, I wish that that was actually more part of our just regular city planning, you know, like, yep. I, don't, I don't know, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> Is there any way that you could partner with the um, uh, Hahamanga nursery and expand that into some kind of a land trust or is that too complicated? Well, that, I mean, that's a separate organization. That's the Arroyo Seca Foundation who runs that. And I'm sure that if we ever did want to uh, do like a restoration where we, you know, where we wanted local genetics or we wanted to even contract grow like plants from a certain preserve or a certain canyon, I mean, they'd be the, probably the first people I would go to, of course, uh, because that's the most local, you know, the, the genetics are the most local that we have in our region. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a different nonprofit, but um, uh, I know that we definitely would be uh, willing and maybe the day will come someday where we could team up with them. Um, but our, our, our current approach is not so much planting stuff. It's trying to get rid of the invasive stuff and mm -hmm. let the native plants with the really local genetics, you know, give them the best conditions to, uh, you know, regenerate themselves. Right, right. Because it's tough to plant those one gallons in the mountains and keep them. <laughs> right, and then take care of them. Yeah. The summer. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I, I asked you about the education component of it. Maybe I let me ask it a little differently schools of course are not coming back to their classrooms within la county but there is this whole group of people who out of northern california who are working with educators all over the country in trying to promote outdoor education like in other words come back to school but come outside um and to, to do that you know you got to use any and every kind of outdoor space possible from from the street that you can close off in front of your school to parkways, to of course parks and the school gardens or school asphalt or whatever outdoor space you have and then bring kids back out of the house and into the outdoors. Would, would suggesting the Royals and Foothills Conservancy and the areas that you do, uh, uh, like the Rosemont Preserve, for instance, would it be possible to even suggest that there is such a thing in Krilak <laughs> Center and perhaps a small group of some school that's nearby and is does want to bring their students back could come and actually have classes outside of is that a possibility or is there too many complicated city no I, I think it's definitely a possibility i mean we've already had sort of just initial conversations about it uh you know it's um i mean it's i i don't, I don't feel like it's been that long since we kind of realized that oh you know we're not really going to kids aren't going to really be going back into the classroom this yeah. This year, or whatever, you know, so, um, or this fall, I'm sorry. Uh, so, you know, uh, or even this whole year, right? So, sure. yeah, we're just starting to, uh, you know, hi have those, explore those uh, options. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, yeah, definitely. And, you know, if this is something you're interested in, Tahere, you know, I mean, it's... Very much, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch about that because it's, uh, you know, we do have an outdoor classroom and it's, I, I, I would say it's definitely... A possibility that we are uh, exploring. We just want to make sure we can do it safely and responsibly right. and that right. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'll send you guys, let me find the link and I'll send you the link of what I'm talking about specifically so that I don't sound so vague, but let me find it and send it to you. It's, it's called Green Schoolyards America. And All right, we'll take a look. Everybody's got their heads buried really deep trying to figure this out. 
Uh, Green squares in America. Uh, we'll, you'll we'll be actually be at this joint, and I will. All right, cool. I'll if pop it go, up right here. There you go. So if you go under COVID, and then if you go under, there's a whole lot, bunch of stuff, but the last one, it says working groups. And actually, anybody can jump into those working groups. Sign in and jump into that conversation. These are all going to be free resources very soon, by the end of the month, for uh, in all school districts ac across the country, whoever can use whichever aspect of it, of how to bring kids out outdoors safely and be able to use any outdoor space that is you know, possible to use. So, awesome. Um, yeah. OK, Thank well. You. I'll look into this. Great resource. Um, thank you, Tahare. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we'll wrap up now. Uh, this is going to be recorded on YouTube. So uh, anyone on YouTube, if you have any questions or whatever, you can reach out. You can leave comments, <laughs> like, and subscribe. Like, I'm getting all YouTube now. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Tim. I, I look forward. I'm glad like people like you and everyone in this chat who I, we know we've worked with are out here. You know, even though we might not be physically connected, we know that we're all still doing what we're doing. Uh, we have our stories and our shared stories and experiences to the places that we love and grew up in. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being a part of this conversation. Um, I guess, you know, enjoy your weekend. We do have a few projects going on in Al Sereno. If you're interested, we're starting a native plant nursery there. Yes. Um, but other than that, uh, I guess everyone... If you have anything else to say, Tim, we can wrap it up and hope everyone has a good night. Well, just thanks. It's nice to, you know, it's nice to hear, uh, you know, these friendly voices that, uh, you know, I haven't heard for a while. So <laughs> nice to hear from you, Joe, and uh, Teresa, and Tahare, and everyone else. And, uh, you know, um, thanks so much. And maybe we can safely, uh, you know, maybe I can check out your nursery sometime soon. Uh, outdoors right uh so uh yeah let's let's try and connect outdoors a little bit um that sounds good but you know thanks so much for inviting me this was this was really nice thank you thank you thank, thank you Tim. thanks okay. thanks, uh, thanks Tim. everyone for joining yeah. all right take care everyone take care all right should we say